Good evening and welcome to this, our last programme in the series. Tonight we'll bring you the concluding part of our story of the computer which seemed to be sending messages through time. We have the results of our National Premonitions Bureau and the case of a man who claims that his ghostly vision helped save a woman's life. But first, here's Chris Choi. Dowsing, it's been called an ancient art. We know it was used 400 years ago to find mineral deposits. More recently, it's been used to trace archaeological remains, buried caves and, most successfully, water. Recently, I heard about a Staffordshire farmer struggling to keep an artificial lake topped up. In desperation, he turned to a private water company. They called in George Applegate, Britain's top water dowser. He told them exactly where to sink a well. I went to watch the drilling. It seemed to be the ideal test. We're dripping wet. Oh. You must be very pleased. What a magnificent sight! <laughs> Tremendous. <laughs> Are you surprised about how they actually found it? Oh, I find that unbelievable. How can they be so accurate? I think it was George who said that we got to go down 80 metres and then we find water at 78. Just unbelievable. The farmer had approached an independent water company. Their director, Andrew Morris, called in the dowser. Well, a great success there, but how important was the dowser in that? Uh, w without a doubt, very important. And the, f and the fact is, we would never entertain um, attempting to sink a borehole water well for, for anybody without his cooperation. But why is that? Because you, you've got all kinds of geological expertise at your fingertips, like, like these maps. Um, this is a hydrogeological map, and here we can see the property that we're actually on today, where we've pinpointed the coordinates, and it just shows us slightly off the main water bearing strata here so even more so the case to use George the, the dowser to give us that accuracy when we're not on major water bearing land. So the geology could have got you what within a couple of hundred feet? I would say so um, but it, it takes out that potluck situation and gives us something definitely to aim for. So he's taking you right to the spot? Correct. Have you used him a lot? We've used him between 50 and 100 sites and has he ever let you down? He's never let us down. We've hit water on every occasion. They'd sent for George Applegate, Britain's top water dowser. He's found supplies for farms, hospitals, even the Ministry of Defence. When Butlin's holiday camps ran dry, Sir Billy Butlin flew George in to restore their supply. He uses geological maps first and then his natural ability. I can find water in any area and I can feel it five or six miles away. How often would you fail? Well, uh, I haven't failed for the last 15 or 20 years. We all know that the water companies have had a hard time recently. Do you do any work for them? I, I have done a lot of work for them. Which kind of companies? Sorry, I can't repeat uh, confidentialities that I have with clients. It must have been about five years ago I was up here looking for water and uh, it comes down across uh, from by that pole over there down across this way and it shoots down across there. This I'll demonstrate and if I you watch, well, I, perhaps I ought to have a different rod that shows up a bit better than this one. This is a whale brown rod that I use very successfully. It found a lot of water Saturday morning for somebody. And then we're coming up to it, and just there, I'm standing on top of the water. Now, the reaction, you, had, you saw a reaction there, you saw a reaction there, and there is another one there. And these side reaction bands, the width of them, with the knowledge of the strata, I can accurately estimate the gallonage. Um, and uh, by using other methods, I can estimate the depth. But that is the water just there. So. What were you feeling? <laughs> well, what was making that well, the rods flip, I, 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 flip over? I'll, I'll tell you again what was happening. I am projecting downwards. You're thinking about the water? I, yes. Mm. And the reaction that I'm getting now is purely my muscles breaking down under a reflex action. But is George unique? 
As a child, geologist Tom Williamson watched his own father learn to douse from necessity in northern Tanzania. He's now convinced that water dousers subconsciously pick up clues from the landscape, such as a lush green area on the horizon or a water-bearing sandstone hill. But that's just part of it. He also believes experienced dousers are receiving information most of us are unaware of. There are a few dousers who can go beyond this. The ground is, is vibrating all the time, although we're, we're not consciously aware of this. But um, distant earthquakes, traffic, aircraft, um, all the time the, the, there, are, there are vibrations in the soil. Now the interesting thing uh, with regard to dowsing is these vibrations are more intense over geological faults, um, mineral veins. Uh, these are precisely the places where, where dowsers have been successful in the past. So what they're doing is, is extending normal abilities? Yes, I would use the word supersensory, um, or supersenses. Is it a supersense? What do scientists say? A physicist in Edinburgh may have some answers. Professor Reddish is doing some classic scientific detective work to find out what's going on. He believes that dowsing is a natural force, just as gravity is, and he can show that it produces a pattern with a regular wavelength. They're all at the same distance. Yeah, they're it's all, all about eight foot apart. They fall, that's right, yeah. about three metres. So that means that this dowsing effect could be a wave pattern like yes. ones that science already Some knows? Some sort of a field. I think any physicist who carries out these experiments would be convinced that we're dealing with a radiation field. The only question is, what is the nature of the radiation field and where does it originate? So what do you think is being detected when the rods start to twitch like that? Anywhere that there is a structure with a different density to the surrounding Earth uh, is detected by dowsing. That applies to water, is only half the density of Earth and so on, you see. Um, Quite a lot of uh, physicists, colleagues, some of them former colleagues, and others who I hadn't met, have written to me and said, uh, I know dowsing works, I've done it myself, but I never dared to say so, because uh, it has such an ill reputation. Well, I'm retired, um, I don't have to have a reputation, you see. Vibrations in the soil, clues in the landscape, reflex action, or a radiation field, George Applegate had told me that anyone can do it. It was time I put that to the test. No. You don't want it to. <laughs> I desperately want it to. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to be much of a rival to you, though. Uh, you can do it. Think it's something pleasant, eating a nice big juicy steak. I, I can feel it now. It's not going... It, it's, yeah, there's a it's twitch, there's a twitch. Yeah. I can feel it's like a thread yeah. attached to the end, just pulling down towards the earth. Yeah. Oh, quite a tension, quite a tension, it's, it's going. Yeah. You've got and it. And that's it, is it? That's it. But you what is causing that? I can well, feel I it keep, pulling I like... I keep telling you what's causing it. So my subconscious mind knows that the water is down there and it's communicating through these muscles. Thank you, let's go home. <laughs> <laughs> He's got it. <laughs> Like me, all our production team use these dousing rods to find water on George's property. And like Professor Reddish, I began to think a natural force is at work, but nobody's come anywhere close to fully explaining it. Do you ever have a strong feeling that something's about to happen and then later find that it does? Well, this is a premonition, one of the most puzzling of all paranormal experiences. People say they come in many ways, as dreams, daytime visions, or even as imaginary news flashes on the television or radio. But do premonitions really happen? Could they be just coincidence or clever guesswork? I had a very vivid dream and it involved a rock concert, a live event, and basically what happened was the, the audience, part of the audience, was suddenly in chaos, a bit of turmoil really, and I felt there was people screaming, being injured, and something serious out of the ordinary had happened. When I wake up with a jolt, I, I know that it's one of my premonition dreams, which I've, I've had a few of, and I, I could tell it was going to happen. And 48 hours later, it was on the front page of The Sun, 60 injured, and I knew that was what I dreamt of, exactly. 
That was one of over 300 cases sent in to the Premonitions Bureau, launched on our pilot program at the end of 1994. The Bureau was open for three months, after which the results were analysed by Dr Keith Hearn, a psychologist who's been studying premonitions for 12 years. I think it's very important to study premonitions because they indicate that current science is fundamentally flawed because normally we expect a cause and then an effect, but in the case of premonitions, it's the other way around. We're getting information about something before it's even happened. Now, this is an anomaly that needs to be investigated. In order to assess the accuracy of a premonition, it was important to know when it had been experienced. So all letters received by the Bureau were date stamped, and then the envelopes were kept as proof of the posting date. Most premonitions come true within hours, days, or just a few weeks from the point of the premonition. Of course, in our study, we had to put a 28-day limit on the duration because if I were to predict a, a plane crash now, one will crash within a year anyway. Well, I usually see things in the early evening or hear things if there's a gap in the news, and I hear this other news bulletin coming in. And this time, I had... Um, bridge collapses, many casualties. And I saw a panoramic view of a river with a bridge spanning it. But as I came around, I seemed to be traveling in a helicopter, and I could see that the far side of the river had white blocks of flats with flat roofs. And I seemed to be quite high up, and I changed and came around, and I could see the gap in the bridge with the river uh, and go down below, but this, uh, the clarity of it meant it was imminent. About a month later, it turned out to be South Korea, and uh, it was early morning, just as I'd seen. As well as looking at individual cases, Keith was also interested in the overall picture. He wanted to discover if there was any statistical evidence that premonitions in general come true. Fifty of the premonitions were chosen at random, after eliminating any which could have been guessed at. Your job then is to compare... He asked two independent judges to compare the sample to events reported in the newspapers. The judges were led to believe that the premonitions referred to two different years. 1994, the correct year, and 1993, the control year. If they judged that more of the premonitions had come true in the correct year, than in the control year, then this would be a positive result. Of the 50 cases I looked at, 29 favoured the actual year in comparison with the control year. And that's in the right direction, and it's almost approaching statistical significance. What, if anything, did you find out about the kind of people who were having premonitions? They were mostly females, but from all age groups and all social groups too. Now, you've split the premonitions into five different categories, if we just have a look at this here. We've got transport, uh, premonitions about prominent people, natural disasters, crime, man-made disasters, and a miscellaneous section there. Within this category of transport premonitions, 75% were about plane crashes. And I find that people tend to have premonitions about things which are important to them. This may represent some general anxiety about flying, or it may be that plane crashes obviously hit the headlines as distinct from, say, car crashes. Keith, you also plotted the birth dates of people who were having premonitions against the phases of the moon. And here on the graph, you can see the full moon in the centre and then new moons at either end. What's the significance of this? We can see that a large number of people who had the premonitions were born either here at the full moon or here and here at the new moon. Now, I've drawn lines so you can see this a bit more clearly. Now, this is particularly interesting, actually, because it matches the results I got in a previous study looking at psychics. Anything which links human abilities to the lunar cycle smacks of astrology, so it must be controversial. I accept that. But, you know, there's other evidence that shows that people in top professions also have similar planetary alignments at their births. So I really do think that this finding needs to be taken seriously. Now, you've been studying uh, premonitions for 12 years. Do you think it could all just be put down to mere coincidence? I'm absolutely sure that some premonitions are, of course, coincidences. That's 
obvious. But above and beyond that, some people have premonitions all the time. They have them repeatedly. This argues strongly against the chance coincidence hypothesis. In addition, a few individuals have a consistent fixed period between the premonition and the later event. Do you know, seven people sent in premonitions of the Japanese earthquake disaster. That's quite remarkable. They singled that thing out. Now, just imagine if we'd actually announced that before the event. We might actually have saved quite a lot of lives. Dr Keith Hearn is continuing his research into premonitions and would like to thank everyone who took part in the survey. Now back to our computer mystery. Last week we told part one of our story which centred on a BBC Model B computer like this dating back to 1984. At that time there was no email, no internet, these machines couldn't be connected to a network and to store information, well you had to do it, on one of these floppy disks. Now it's important to remember all of that as we continue the story. You may recall Ken and Debbie found strange messages on their computer. The writer, Lucas, claimed to be living in the 16th century. Along with the messages came poltergeist activity. Their research later showed that Lucas was an alias. His real name was Thomas Harden. Thomas was arrested and thrown into prison to await execution. In his last message, he revealed his box of lights had come from a group calling themselves 2109. But were they really from the future? And could they help save Thomas's life? Well, I'm sorry we didn't get any messages from either the past or the future. But that's about par for the course. Doesn't the SBR ever find anything? I wouldn't say that. We quite often detect an obvious fraud. But when nothing at all happens, there's not much we can do. Perhaps they burned your Lucas. We have to be careful. You know, science says this is simply not possible. I didn't say it was possible. I just said it happened. I can't believe he's dead. If Thomas was in prison, he wouldn't be able to communicate, would he? That's a good point. There must be something we can do. You've changed your tune. Maybe I have. And 2109? Oh, I can't say I'm sorry not to hear from them. Oh, come on. Let's go to the pub. Ken. What? There's a message, a long one. Ken, Deb, Peter. Thomas, he's alive. I don't know. I think it's from 2109. You have two choices. One, that we explain this experiment, but cause what should not be to happen. Or two, understand that you have a purpose that shall change the face of history. We, 2109, must not affect you directly, but guide you and allow room for your own destiny. That's bullshit. Calm down. Calm down? Thomas is in trouble. Might even be dead. We've got a computer that's doing Star Trek impressions. I don't believe in destiny and all that crap. It makes a kind of sense. We are Thomas's future. They're our future. They? Who are they? What, what is, is our name? Too, too perfect, perfect that we make mistakes. As, As we must have our character. A movement that casts no shadows. shadows. Thought without reaction. Love without passion. Hate without anger, wars without lives lost. How can you have a name? We are many, but no more than one at a time to come. You know the last message we thought was from Thomas? You mean it's not? Uh, a man called Fowlshurst. Fowlshurst? Who's he? Remember the sheriff? It's him. Here's the translation. Lucas didn't cry for mercy before the court. Instead, he said the box of lights could only have come from God. But I ask you, are you demons? You checked him out? Absolutely. According to the records, Fowlshurst was involved in some kind of conspiracy against the king. And he's still the sheriff? Well, they don't know about it yet. But if they did, he'd be dropped right in it, wouldn't he? 
Well, you do, Peter. You're better at the lingo than I am. He's answered. My most noble Peter, if you swear not to use your power, then I shall free Lucas within the hour. Peter did it. It worked. I beg your forgiveness, but I meant him no harm. I shall do this, for you are my friends. What a creep. <laughs> my good friends, I do weep so much that I can be with my friends again. It's a pity that I can't hold you to my breast. I know you as well as my own family since your time opened up to me. But I must move on soon. It's best since the people of Doddleston no fear me. Thomas. Without knowledge, you have fear. With fear, you create your own nightmares. Dead to one, O oh man. in control of Holtgeber's activity. We are not here to play games. We are tactics. We watch and react accordingly in the vertical plane. The flower reaches to the eye of withers in the burning light. Safe are the bodies of the Sarsat and world. We are stopping the communication of the Totons. You will stay with Thomas all night. I have a new mattress and new blankets on my bed. Come. Sit here with me, pretty Debbie. Don't be affrighted. Be cold. Your perfume haunts my house. Your hand is softer than any fair hand. It'd be unreal. Not only for your unnatural beauty, but also that you make me 400 years too old for you, mate. <laughs> One day, Debbie will know Thomas as nothing but history. Am I to live knowing nothing else? F forgive me, Debbie. I am but foolish. Fascinated that 2109 claims to be composed entirely of tachyons. Whatever they are. Well, they're theoretical, or rather conjectural, particles without mass. They can travel faster than the speed of light. Yes, so? Well, if they can travel faster than the speed of light, they can travel through time. I've set up the new test. I've typed in a list of questions for 2109, which only I know. We'll seal the kitchen for one hour, then I'll erase the questions, OK? If you get an answer, then you'll have some proof. So what can we do? I want all three of you to stay in here where we can see you, please. You still think we're having you on? Deb, John, 
Certain words from that time are only used at certain places and at certain times. It takes me weeks to cross-check the language on one of these, and they come every day. It'd take months to compose one of these from scratch. How can it be a hoax? We have a routine to follow. Does it answer the questions or not? Your 2109 obviously knew what the questions were. I think we'd like you to send them another message. So they're a bit less smug about it than they were then, are they? Not before time. John's asked us to ask them another question. The solution to Fermat's last theorem. What's that? Complicated mathematical puzzle. Never been solved. I left it on the screen for you. We wonder how much David would like the answer to his question if he knew the consequences. We know your deepest fear. Before we tell you, do you swear to grant us a wish? And I wrote that back. If it be in our power so to do, and that we do not lose our bodies, minds, and souls to you. Is that it? Did you drag us down here for this? Then let the man who is willing to lose these step forward. No death. Come on, John. You've never believed any of it anyway. You do it. My true fellows and sweet maid, I go now to Oxford to write my book about my brothers and maid, and of our love for each other. I shall not go to my god until it is written. I write this in the hope that my dear friends will one day find this book. For on that day, our lands may not be so distant, and we shall all be truly embraced across the centuries. Thomas. It's a fascinating tale. Dr. Richard Wiseman went to see Ken, Debbie and Peter Trinder to try to find some answers. This case is impressive because we have some hard evidence to examine. Between two and three hundred messages apparently written by a man in 1546. Clearly there are only two options. Either the messages are genuine or they're not. And if they're not, then it's a hoax. I spoke to Ken and Debbie about the events which took place in Meadow Cottage ten years ago. Since then they've made new lives for themselves and don't wish to be identified. Do you think there could be a, a normal explanation for what was going on? I'm sure there will be a normal explanation, but not currently, no. I mean, I'm as puzzled as the next person as to what was happening. All I managed to do was to record what happened. Was there one particular event that convinced you it was paranormal? Although lots of people find the poltergeist activity interesting, what was meaningful to me was the messages, which were over 16 months, and the communication with a real person. Ken's friend, Peter Trinder, was checking the message's authenticity. If somebody was doing this as a hoax, they would have had to do one hell of a lot of research 
to organize this. All right, it could have been done. Somebody spent a long time doing this in advance. But what for? Could it have been a kind of inside job? Because yourself, Ken and Debbie had access to this information. Maybe one of the three of you was hoaxing it. Well, if it, if it were me, of course, yes, it would have been done. And, uh, but I would know. There would be no point in the whole thing. I can honestly say it wasn't me. I mean, but you believe or you don't believe. I knew that it wasn't me. And I did not believe that it could be Ken. Of course, always from the start, that was the assumption I started with when he first gave me this strange piece of paper over the school dinner table one day and said, do you understand this? And I said, well, let me take it home and have a look at it, knowing I got the dictionary. And I thought, well, now, this dictionary will soon prove that this is a, a bit of silly nonsense. But, of course, it didn't. Peter has examined the words which make up the messages, but I wanted to find out if other aspects of the language might provide important clues. Looking at the verb structure, there are things which Lucas says that would not have been said in 1546. It's true that individuals can make up individual words, but we don't make up our verbs. It's possible, or it was possible in England in 1546 to say, I do, thou dost, he, she, or it doth, he, she, or it does. But it wasn't possible to say, I doth, or he, she, or it dost. Now, all the way through um, Lucas's messages, he mixes and messes up these suffixes with the wrong subject. Do you think it's some kind of hoax or forgery? Well, it's certainly... Uh, if, if it's meant to look like early modern English writing, it doesn't even look close. So do you think it's a sophisticated hoax by somebody who has a background in modern English? No, if somebody had a background in early modern English writing, they would do a, they would, their hoax would look a lot better than this. I mean, they would get their verbal inflections correct. They wouldn't choose vocabulary that came from a period long before the period that this is supposed to have been written in. Um, they'd do it a lot better. We've had the uh, Lucas's messages analysed by two mm. experts. Mm. They have said that these are definitely not from the 16th century. They are like 20th century hoaxes. Mm. They don't have the right feel about them mm -hmm. grammatically to be mm -hmm. from the 16th century. What would you say to that? I'd be interested to see the, the detail of it. This is, of course, what you, in a way, in many ways, you'd expect this sort of reaction. I don't think, I suppose, there's an academic in the land who would say, this is real. Not anybody wanted to keep their position. This is a BBC Model B, like the one that Ken and Debbie used. I used to have one myself in the 80s, and so I know what they can and cannot do. When you switch them off, all of the information in the memory is wiped, and so it seems unlikely that somebody would have planted the messages on the computer before Ken brought it home from school. With the messages, were there any uh, occasions when it couldn't have been Ken and yourself, that somebody looked at the computer, then walked out, shut the room, kept an eye on Ken and yourself, walked back in and saw a message? Obviously, in the beginning, we wanted to eliminate ourselves. Ken would go miles and miles away. He may be with friends. I would sit with various people. Some people I had only met once. And uh, they put a question on the computer, and a message came. And all the time, I was in one room, never entering the room where the computer was at any time, always in view. And also, with Ken being clearly not there, it eliminated him as well. So who could have been planting these messages? Dr Wright suggested one way in which the language might help us find out. She compared the messages from Lucas with the descriptive passages from Ken's book. She took a 500 word sample from both Lucas and Ken and looked at how many times they used an adjective in front of a noun. Ken used one 26.6% of the time, Lucas 26% of the time. And that's not just the percentage for everyone writing around the time Ken wrote his book. 1986. She checked that by looking at some journalism and also a romantic novel both written then. They both used adjectives in front of nouns around 32 to 35 percent of the time. We've always really rather hoped for some constructive comments about it and in the light of something I've heard today about language and about its construction being possibly similar to my own construction this is particularly remarkable since I wasn't in the building, as I say, for something like four-fifths of the occasions when messages are appeared. It was very real. That's all I'm saying, Richard. It was very close. The kind of thing that you could not doubt. But all the time one was aware of the possibility of hoax. But if it was a hoax, by golly, it was brilliant. It's a strange sort of question. Did you hoax it yourselves? Because we, we were the only people with the opportunity. But to be honest, this phenomenon has a built-in endpoint. 
simply that if somebody comes across and finds Thomas's book, if somebody finds that, well, these sorts of discussions become irrelevant, and I'm really quite happy to wait until that point to sort all the finer detail out. Richard also spoke to the two investigators from the Society for Psychical Research who chose not to appear on camera. They too thought it was a hoax, but had no idea how it was done. Finally tonight, a slight dizziness or a funny feeling inside, call it what you like, but when one man had such an experience, he said he heard a voice calling from the dead. That voice saved a woman's life. Miss Hildry, one of my customers, was a very difficult one, and she would go out of her way to make my assistants in our fish shop most uncomfortable. And quite frankly, I disliked her intensely. One of the very few people who could get through to Miss Hildry was my wife. And the reason what my wife gave her so much attention was she believed that someone should not go through life like that, unloved and unwanted. And so she did everything she could to make her feel at ease. It was about five weeks, I should think, after Ruth died. Out of the blue, just as I sat on the bed waiting to go up to the shop, suddenly in front of me a blur occurred. And Ruth's voice said, go and help Miss Hildry. She's in dreadful trouble. Please, darling, go and help Miss Hildry. I kept looking at the telephone and realizing that I should get on to somebody, preferably the police, which I did. I spoke to a senior officer, actually, and I told him my story. Dreadfully far-fetched and, well, unbelievable. But he took, he believed me, and he said, he said, I'll send a, a car down. And he did. When the police got to Miss Hildry's house, they could get no answer, so they had to break in. There they found Miss Hildry lying on the floor, and she'd had a heart attack. I received a letter of thanks from the senior officer at Slough Police Station, thanking me for saving her life. But of course, it wasn't me that saved her life. It was Ruth, after all. Perhaps it was pure coincidence, or maybe he'd overheard a conversation which subconsciously had preyed on his mind. That's all from us. Thank you for all of your letters and to those of you who took part in the series. But most of all, thank you for watching. Good night. <laughs>